In late 1985, Asgardian Wars came out, and despite its strange merger of Thor mythology with X-Men continuity, as well as its convoluted formatting as a miniseries slash special edition slash annual, it found an enthusiastic audience, one that has endured to this day. Claremont has singled out Asgardian Wars as a favorite creation of his, describing it quite dramatically as, quote, a really nifty pair of stories being penciled by two of the best in the business today. X-Men, Alpha Flight, Loki, Old Gods, New Gods, Ancient Spells, More Ancient Curses, Possession, Dispossession, Repossessions, Hearts Lost, Powers Won, Love, Death, Politics, Dishonor, Trolls, Dark Elves, Sorcery, Angst, Apotheosis, Tragedy, and Triumph." End quote. Interestingly, what first spurred the Asgardian War storyline was a ploy on the part of editors Jim Shooter and Nascenti and Denny O'Neill to get Claremont and John Byrne together on a book once again. The thinking was that the best way to do this would be by combining Claremont's X-Men with Byrne's Alpha Flight. While this worked at first, Byrne eventually withdrew from the project. No such luck. Claremont stayed with the project anyway, as he was a great admirer of the original Asgardian mythology cultivated by Kirby and Lee, calling it, quote, a truly cosmic stage on which anything was possible." End quote. Adding to the lure of Asgard, Claremont's close friend Walt Simonson was in the middle of his now iconic run on Thor at the time, and had just wrapped the Surtur Saga in March of that same year, arguably the most heralded Thor story in comics history, and something that Claremont referenced extensively in the Asgardian Wars storyline. The final roster of creators on the storyline reads as something of an all-star team, highlighted by Claremont on writing, Paul Smith and Art Adams on pencils, Terry Austin, Bob Wyacek, and Mike Mignola, yes, the Hellboy guy, on inks, Glynis Oliver on coloring, Tom Orzachowski on lettering, and Anne Nascenti and Danny O'Neill on editing duty. Despite appearing across three separate titles, the unity of the story is achieved through the role of Loki as antagonist, and through the shared theme of the high cost of getting what you long for. The first half of the story concerns Loki's attempt to win favor with a group of Elder Gods by giving humankind a limitless boon that could eradicate all manner of suffering but the cost of magic, including the magic of human imagination. The story is a charming mixture of mythic parable crossed with a Stephen King-like depiction of isolated humans turning on each other in the face of the supernatural. In short, it's a story that is perfectly suited to the superhero self-doubt and contemplation that Claremont is famous for. It ends with a defeated Loki vowing not to harm the X-Men, but clearly planning, in true Loki style, how to get around that promise. The moral of the story is simple. Quote, Humanity alone carries within itself the power to create paradise on Earth, on its own terms, by its own efforts, without the gifts or machinations of greedy gods, which, for better or worse, is how it should be. End quote. The story picks up in New Mutants Special Edition, with Loki immediately plotting his revenge. Drawn to Storm, he conscripts the Enchantress to his service in abducting Aurora as a roundabout way of punishing the X-Men. The New Mutants are unfortunately caught in the crossfire and dragged to Asgard themselves. Like X-Men slash Alpha Flight, the story is a character-driven exploration of motivation and design, isolating each of the New Mutants in turn and placing them in situations of specific resonance to their characters, testing and defining all of them as both individuals and as heroes. These vignettes are each potent in their own way, showcasing some of Claremont's finest character work with his New Mutants roster, prompted by the fantastic settings of Asgard in order to empower the fantasies depicted. The story ends with a modest victory, the defeat of the Enchantress and the reunion of the New Mutants. Resolution is achieved, however, in Uncanny X-Men Annual No. 9, with the X-Men coming to the rescue. Combined, the junior and senior teams defeat Loki, reflect on the true meaning of heroism, in part using the lessons learned in the X-Men Alpha Flight chapter, and then return home. Though final, the resolution isn't without consequences. The characters come back dramatically altered by their experiences, everything ranging from the cultivation of mortal consciousness to becoming an actual Valkyrie. The effects of the event are both monumental and long-standing, showcasing the kind of character advancement and status quo shifts that contemporary comic storytelling traditionally avoids. Even by the standards of the time, at this point in comics history, annuals and crossover minis don't usually do much of consequence. They're fun, lighthearted romps, typically detached from main canon. Moreover, having superheroes visit one comics universe from that of another is, likewise, often a frivolous affair. This is not the case, however, in Asgardian Wars. Few people associate X-Men with Asgard, but Claremont's dive into this world produced one of the finest X-Men stories of all time, a pinnacle of his character work on the franchise, and an absolute showcase of some of the finest X-Men creative teams ever assembled. 
against all expectations. As Guardian Wars is a brilliant piece of comic storytelling, one that has stood the test of time and continues to feature prominently on favorite X-Men story lists more than 35 years later. Put very simply, it's a good one. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the Claremont Run project, you can follow us on Twitter at Claremont Run or visit us on the web at www.claremontrun.com.